The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, so today we're going to think about the even, well, also the low end of the polynomial hierarchy. Um, so most of this class is about polynomial versus not polynomial and various notions of hardness, NP-hardness, and worse. Um, we looked briefly at P-completeness, uh, which is about parallel computing. Uh, today we're going to be thinking about regular good old sequential computing, but trying to distinguish linear time versus nonlinear time. And in particular, trying to find problems that are quadratic or cubic in N uh, for sequential running times. And probably the most popular attack on this is called threesome, which is the following. Problem, you're given n integers, let's say, and you want to know, do any three of them sum to 0? So uh, of course, you can solve this in cubic time by testing all triples, whether they sum to 0. Uh, but you can also solve it in quadratic time. Um, so it's not an algorithms class, so I won't ask you to come up with the algorithm, but they're quite, quite easy. Uh, first, uh, order n squared randomized uh, is really easy. You take all pairwise sums. So first of all, you build uh, a dictionary, a hash table, of all the integers. And then you um, look at all pairwise sums. For each pairwise sum, you see whether the negation is in the hash table in constant time. So that gives you n squared randomized. Because uh, if uh, you know a plus b plus c equals 0 is the same thing as a plus b equal minus c. So you look at all pairwise sums, see whether the negation is in the list of integers. Okay, you can also do uh, order n squared deterministic. This is uh, a more fun puzzle, but I'll spoil the answer for you just to give you intuition for why this problem is n squared. Uh, for every possible target sum minus c, so if that's going to happen n times, I'm going to run the following linear time algorithm, which is I start. So this is just two copies of the integers in sorted order. I have n log n time to sort, so that's no problem. I'm going to start from with my left finger here and my right finger here and look at the sum of those two numbers. If it's too big, I have a particular target uh, negative c in mind. If the sum of these two numbers is smaller than negative c, then I'm going to advance this one because if this is in sorted order, that will make my sum larger. If the sum is too big, I will advance this one backwards. So in general, I have my right finger advancing left or my left finger advancing right in each step, one of the two advances. And this will not miss. Uh, this will tell you whether that target sum is among the pairwise sums from this thing. In linear time, we have to do that n times once for each target sum. So that's the fancy quadratic algorithm. No fancy data structures required. Uh, cool. So three sum is quadratic, and the big conjecture is that you can't solve it any faster. Well, you can, so <laughs> it's not quite the conjecture. Um, the conjecture is uh, that there is no n to the 2 minus epsilon algorithm uh, in general, in the worst case. Uh, let me tell you. Before we get to, and this has led to a whole world of lower bounds of threesome hardness. If your problem is threesome hard, then you expect it ha also has no n to the 2 minus epsilon algorithm, because if it did, threesome would. And people generally believe that's uh, the case for threesome. But there are some exceptions. So one uh, thing is that the numbers have to be fairly large. Um, if, if all of the integers are in the range, let's say, minus u to u, that's the universe size, uh, then via FFT, you can solve the problem in u log u time, plus linear time. Uh, so your numbers better be at least 
larger than n squared. In fact, we'll see n cubed suffices. Uh, so they don't have to be huge, but they do have to be bigger than linear or quadratic. Um, more generally, there are a bunch of subquadratic, but only slightly subquadratic algorithms. The first one uh, achieves a roughly log squared savings, although a little bit less is a log log squared <laughs> in the denominator. Um, this is a randomized algorithm in a model of computation called the word ram. So if you're interested in the word ram, you should take advanced data structures. But uh, basically, you can manipulate, let's say, log n bit words in constant time. You can add them together, multiply them, that sort of thing. Uh, and you assume that the numbers you're dealing with fit in a word. Because if you're going to compare them, you'd also need that assumption. Um, so that's a reasonable model. And it essentially affords a kind of logarithmic amount of parallelism. And so because it's a quadratic problem, roughly speaking, you get a quadratic amount in the parallelism of the model. Uh, so that's a bit Im improved. This is uh, by uh, two former MIT students, Ilya Baron and Mihai Petrescu and myself. Um, and very recently, this year, there's been uh, a, another nice improvement. It's actually three algorithms, depending on your model but all based on a similar idea. Oops, did I get these backwards? I think so. So first, uh, these two results. So this, these are results by Gronland and Petty. Seth Petty he gave a talk here about it recently. Um, in a real RAM model of computation, this is a weaker model of computation, so the result is stronger. Um, in a real RAM, uh, you're, you're still, you still assume that the numbers you're given, you can add them. Uh, I think actually all he needs is the ability to add them and compare them, maybe subtract. Uh, yeah, also subtract. But uh, no multiplication is really uh, useful in that particular model uh, because you can't extract bits out of the thing. So you don't assume that they're integers. You just treat them as real numbers. And all you know how to do is add a bunch of them and compare those additions. Uh, so that's a weaker model of computation. And still, they're able to get a roughly logarithmic improvement, not quite as strong as the quadratic in log. Uh, and, but one advance is that this is the first deterministic algorithm to beat n squared. Uh, so randomization isn't necessary to achieve that, um, though this is two-thirds power. Uh, but the other advance is that you don't need to manipulate the individual bits. So even in the randomized model, that's, that's nice. Uh, and then the major thing, and sort of the first thing to call into question, the three-sum conjecture, which is that conjecture, is uh, I wouldn't really call this an algorithm, but it's a thing which runs in roughly n to the 1.5 time. Uh, but here it's a more powerful model, a super powerful model, called the decision tree model, uh, where the idea is that an algorithm is specified by an entire tree. The depth of the tree is this big. Each node of the tree says, uh, add you know, these five things, compare them to these five things. Uh, and see uh, which is bigger. And then branch, there's a left branch and a right tree. If you've ever seen comparison trees, same thing, but uh, the comparisons are more interesting. Uh, but this is not an algorithm because we don't know how to compute that tree efficiently. We can compute it in probably polynomial time, but definitely not. We don't know how to compute it in sub quadratic time or sub this time. So it's, a l it's kind of a frustrating situation because we know that uh, this thing is sort of out there, but actually finding it is hard. And there are actually several problems in computer science since the 80s, I think, where we know better decision trees than we know algorithms. 
So my sense would be uh, that the decision tree model is strictly more powerful. The three-sum conjecture is true for regular algorithms, <laughs> as if you define it this way or this way. Uh, but in the decision tree model, obviously, you can do a lot better. Question. What's the reason to believe like the decision tree model over just like some bit that we like run a polynomial time algorithm and then like look at the bit and it tells us the answer? Oh, you mean why? Like why do we why should we believe that decision trees are like a model of computation that we should care about? Like oh no, you shouldn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> decision tree is not a model you should consider a reasonable computer, but it's interesting in that it suggest you know it gives you this tantalizing feeling that maybe you could turn this into a real algorithm that you could run on a computer but definitely yeah you cannot if you don't know what the decision tree is you can't run it on a computer directly so it's not uh, a model of computation in the strict sense it's especially interest i mean it's always important to see how the model of computation relates to the bounds particularly if you're going to try to prove a lower bound there are some lower bounds of n squared in restricted forms of the decision tree model. This says you can't extend those lower bounds to arbitrary decision trees. Decision trees are traditionally used as a lower bound model. If you can prove a lower bound there, because it's a very powerful model, that implies lower bounds in something like the real RAM. So that's why people care in some sense. This says you can't prove a strong lower bound in that model, which is annoying. Another question? So what does the tree depend on, like the structure and the contents of the node? Does it depend on the values of the integer or only the number of them? Um, I'm pretty sure in this model uh, you have a constant number of original integers. You add them together and compare them to a constant number of original integers. Right, right, but like, what is the? I mean, I can compute the tree in some. I can take oh. time to compute the tree, but then what does it depend on? Like, if I change the value. Well, yeah, the, the tree of course has exponential size, so you never would actually want to compute it explicitly. What you want to compute is, after I've done some number of things, what's the next operation that happens? Yeah, sorry, that's still not my question. Though. So my okay. question is like, what changes the actual structure of the tree? Is it just the number of n? Oh, yeah, n. Right. The, de the decision tree only depends on n. Okay. Yeah. I mean, in some sense, the decision tree is encoding an adaptive algorithm that, depending on the results of previous comparisons, tells you what to do next. But if you think of it as the entire tree, then it's only depending on n. Okay. Yep. But because it's so big, I mean, that doesn't help us. <laughs> You could imagine pre-computing for n, but there's no way to store it, or and you couldn't really afford that exponential time. OK, so uh, that's a short story about the known upper bounds and also the known lower bounds on threesome. Uh, there are some weak lower bounds in a particular version of the decision tree model when you can only compare, uh, I think, sums of two items. Then you can get an n squared lower bound, but that's not especially interesting given this result. So anymore. Let me tell you briefly about k-sum, which is the obvious generalization. Instead of 3, do any k of them sum to 0. Um, here, they're actually stronger or lower bounds. Um, so if 3-sum is the most popular thing considered for proving quadratic lower bounds, because a lot of problems we care about are linear or quadratic, so 3-sum gets a lot of the attention. Uh, K-sum is a little easier to argue about. In particular, it's NP-hard in general. Right? This imp in particular encodes something like partition. Um, if, you th if you have n integers and their overall sum is 0, and you want to know whether any n over 2 of them sum to 0 or something like that, that would be roughly partition. So this is NP-hard. So definitely, it's got to get hard for some k. Um, and in fact, you can show fixed parameter hardness, w1 hardness, uh, with respect to k. Uh, so in particular, if you assume the exponential time hypothesis, uh, then you can get some lower bounds. And the best lower bound known so far is that there's no n to the little o of k algorithm. assuming regular ETH. Uh, for this, we need to assume that k is less than or equal to, is not too giant. Because um, I guess if k equals n, for example, this problem is really easy. So we have to, it can't go all the way. Uh, so this says, well, maybe we don't get the constant right, but there's some kind of n to the roughly k dependence. Uh, so 
you know, there's a reason that there's a number here larger than one, although we don't know how to prove that. The feeling is uh, three sum, k sum, they require roughly n to some constant times k. You could debate about what the constant is, but we have this theorem. Um, and uh, on the upper bound side, and what people believe is the right answer, is k over 2 ceiling, at least randomized. If you want deterministic, you might get a log factor. Uh, but you can definitely achieve this by the same kind of do all k over 2 y sums uh, twice, and then look for collisions in a hash table. Okay, So uh, the ceiling is what's making 3 sum into a quadratic thing. Uh, but 4 sum d is just as easy as 3 sum. Um, because you can still solve it in quadratic time. Okay, but five sum is the conjecture is that requires n cube time. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Is that a known result or just something that? This is an upper bound, okay. is known. Yeah, and then the conjecture uh, is that that's tight. Uh, that there's no n to the ceiling k over two minus epsilon algorithm. That's what we don't know. But yeah, algorithm is easy. So that's k-sum, and this gives you some more intuition for why you should expect these problems are hard. In particular, uh, if you could prove k-sum requires, I mean, if you could prove this conjecture, you prove the exponential time hypothesis. You pr and you, so you prove p does not equal mp, and you ma make a million dollars, and lots of good things happen. So we should try to do this. Um, <laughs> Of course, uh, as I mentioned, three sum is the one we uh, use the most in this world because uh, for NP hard problems, usually we use NP hardness and all the stuff we did. You could use K sum, but that's basically partition. Um, and uh, but this is sort of motivation for why you should think three sum is hard. I'll leave it at that. So uh, let me talk about three sum hardness. So I'm going to call a problem three sum hard if uh, if that algorithm has an n to the two minus epsilon time algorithm, then uh, so does three sum. Okay, this is what we want. want to s if I say a problem is three sum hard, it means it shouldn't be solvable in less than quadratic time, other than this polylog stuff. So uh, this is the formal meaning. You can solve it in subquadratic, uh, truly subquadratic time. This is often called the minus epsilon. Uh, then three sum can be solved in truly subquadratic time, contradicting the three sum conjecture. So if you believe this three sum conjecture, it means this is not possible for your problem. And the way we're going to do that usually is with a three sum reduction. Uh, there are other ways to do it. You don't have to follow this particular style of reduction, but most of them do. Uh, so it's going to be a multi-call reduction, but we have to, in this world, we have to be careful about polynomial factors. We don't want to call your thing n times and say that was a legitimate reduction. So we'll say you can call, if you're reducing from a to b, uh, then that means you can solve b using a, and you're going to make a constant number of calls to a. Uh, sorry, other way around. <laughs> it means I can solve A using B. Uh, usually we take an instance here, reduce it to an instance here. That's okay. Uh, but because we're going to want to solve not just decision problems, uh, we're going to say, okay, you take your instance of A, you can call an oracle for solving B a constant number of times, as long as the thing you call it with is also not much bigger. Um, so the n prime that you call this thing with should be linear in n. Uh, and the running time of the reduction should be subquadratic. Okay, pretty much all reductions, it's like n, n log n, maybe n log squared n. But it should be strictly less than n squared, otherwise the reduction doesn't tell you much about the, whether the problem is quadratic or not. Uh, so. With this much running time, plausibly you could construct a larger instance. But this constraint says the thing you 
this, the instance of B that you call should be linear in size so that quadratic over here is the same thing as quadratic over here. Okay, so those are the rules of the game. We're not going to have to worry about these constraints too much. Most of our reductions are constant factor blow up and uh, run in a reasonable amount of time, but we've got to be a little careful here to make sure that running time is not huge. Usually we're allowed polynomial time. Okay, so if you have a three sum reduction from A to B, and you know A is three sum hard, then B is three sum hard. N prime is the size of uh, N prime is the size of the thing that you're, the instance you're calling with. So if you have an instance X over here, uh, you have some X prime over here, and N prime is the size of X prime. There's a constant number of them, but I want all of those instances to be linear size. Okay, so initially uh, A is going to be 3-sum. Three 3-sum three is 3-sum hard. Because <laughs> if it has a subquadratic algorithm, then so does itself. Uh, and so that's actually easy. In NP-hardness, that's not so easy. But uh, And now we're going to, if we uh, let B be some other problem, then we'll prove hardness. Um, in this world, because we don't have any you know, solid lower bounds to work from, it's also interesting to go in both directions. Uh, I'm not going to define a notion of completeness here, uh, just because it hasn't been done. But you could define three-sum completeness to mean uh, you can reduce from three-sum and you can reduce to three-sum. Uh, we'll see a few problems in that. Uh, usually people call that equivalence, subquadratic equivalence. Uh, OK, so let me start with uh, some base three-sum hard problems to start from. Uh, this all. A lot of this comes from uh, a paper, uh, this paper, uh, by Gayenten and Overmars, 1995. Um, and it, uh, they had been collecting over the years a whole bunch of mostly computational geometry problems, which are three-sum hard, um, in that you can reduce three-sum to all of them. Uh, but in the center here is a bunch of core problems, three-sum, three-sum prime, uh, which I would call an ABC version of three-sum. We've seen a few ABC problems in the past, uh, and a geometric version of three-sum. So let me tell you about those. Uh, first of all, uh, three-sum is three-sum hard, even when U is order N cubed. So that's nice to know. The integers you're working with don't have to be giant. Uh, this is based on a hashing argument, but uh, which we won't go into. OK, so what is 3 sum prime? 3 uh, sum prime, you're given uh, three sets of integers, A, B, C. Yeah? Um, for, for these reductions, we're only using deterministic reductions? Uh, let's say we're only using deterministic reductions, although randomized would also be interesting. Uh, you just have to weaken this statement. But here, um, I'll say. Uh, deterministic. Does the hashing argument for why threesome would? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you can de-randomize that hashing scheme. Uh, I need to double check, but uh, yeah, that's the claim. Yeah, that is a good question. So this is the ABC version of threesome. Uh, we just want the three items to come from three particular sets. Um, and traditionally, this one is phrased as A plus B equals C, although you could also say A plus B plus C equals 0. Uh, it's the same thing. You're just negating all the Cs. And in this world, because you know you have one item from each set, uh, that's actually it's really easy to just negate one subset of them. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether you put a minus sign here or not. but I will not, because that's how three-sum prime is usually defined. Uh, so uh, I claim three-sum prime is three-sum hard. Why? Uh, I let capital A, if I'm given uh, a three-sum instance, let's call it S. S is a set of n integers. I'm going to let A equal S. I'm going to let B equal S. I'm going to let C equal negative S. Done. Okay, So that's a reduction from three-sum.
this discovery function on the other one? Uh, like if zero is in your list, uh, the way the, the instance that you constructed, you might choose some element x of the list from A, the same element x from B, and then y from C, and x plus x might be, uh, plus, I, I guess, uh, plus y might equal zero, oh, whereas in the original list you didn't have x twice. Uh, I was just giving the example of choosing sure. zero three times as a convenient example for that. Uh, so that you can also detect in linear time. What do you mean? You can detect whether there are any such triples. If you allow repetition, then you answer the question. Right, your goal is to solve threesome. So you're solving threesome by calling, by making oracle calls to threesome prime. Right, so, so if you can solve threesome ahead of time, you're done. In linear time, you can check whether there are any pairs that allow, with some duplication, uh, a solution to the threesome instance. I th I, so this is not addressed in the paper, which make, makes me think that uh, this definition of three s in this definition of threesome, we allow the items to we al basically every item it could be used three times, up to three times. There's no requirement that they're distinct items. So then this reduction is fine. I don't think that's a big deal and you can get rid of it, but uh, that must be how it's normally defined. I didn't specify whether it was uh, three distinct items, but let's allow uh, multiplicity there and then this reduction is fine. Because that's what the paper does. Okay, uh, with more effort, like adding big integers and so on, you can reduce in the other direction, reduce from three sum prime to three sum. Uh, I won't cover that because I just want to prove the three sum hardness about things. But in fact, uh, all these three problems are identical to each other. If any one of them is subquadratic, then they all are. So that's nice because three sum prime is really a special case of three sum. Okay, so uh, next problem is the geometric problem. They call it geometric base problem. So here we're in 2D. And we're given n points uh, whose y coordinates are all 0, 1, or 2. You can imagine y, <laughs> such three lists. Um, and so they all live on three horizontal lines 0, 1, and 2. Here are the points. And we want to know uh, is there a non horizontal line? that passes through uh, three points. Uh, like this. Okay, so I claim geom base is three sum hard, and this is their proof. Um, on the first line, we put A. On the last line, we put B. And in the middle line, we put every item in C divided by two. Okay, so if you look at, uh, oh sorry, and this is a reduction from three sum prime, right? So I have three integers. I want to know whether you can ever get a plus b equals c. Um, so the idea is, if I have two items a and b, uh, then this point. I mean, if I just draw the line and intersect it with the y equals one line, that point will be the average of little a and little b. So a plus b over two. And so if there's an item uh, C that matches A plus B, then the C over 2 will equal the A plus B over 2. So there's going to be a line through three points, if and only if 3 sum prime had a yes answer. Okay, And you can, reverse, uh, you can reduce in the reverse direction. Uh, <coughs> in fact, just like this. <laughs> you just multiply all these coordinates by 2. That gives you C. All right. So those are our starting points. And we're going to use all of them. 
Um, and I'm just going to run through a bunch of examples of three sum hard problems. So all of them shouldn't have subquadratic time algorithms unless uh, three sum does. So um, the obvious starting point here is uh, what's called degeneracy testing in computational geometry. So usually we like to assume you have endpoints in the plane, they're in general position, meaning no three are collinear. So uh, the problem is, given endpoints, are any three of them collinear? Question? Three three sum prime says they're integers, so how do you go that way? Oh, uh, integers and rational, same thing. You just scale up D and multiply. So everything here, I'm going to, because we're going to go into geometry, I will use rationals quite a bit. Yeah, so I can multiply everything by two to make it integers again. Uh, but this problem does not say integers, so that's why I'm allowed to do that. I start with integers, and then I do this. But you could also add integers here. It wouldn't make a big difference. OK, um, so uh, given n points in the plane, are any three collinear? This, I'm guessing, is the original motivation for defining threesum. This is really a harder version of the problem. This is kind of a special case. But in particular, um, it's not exactly the same because we forbid horizontal lines, right? We had to construct a very degenerate instance with lots of points on horizontal lines in order for this correspondence to work. So the question is, can you make something that is only degenerate, only has three points collinear, uh, when the three-sum instance has a, s a solution? And this reduction is a little unsatisfying, and I don't have a great intuition for it. But uh, it's very simple. We're going to take, um, this is going to be a reduction from uh, regular old three sum, not three sum prime. So every number x, we're going to map to the point x comma x, x cubed. OK, cubed because it's odd and not 1, basically. Uh, and so we take our, our uh, x values, and uh, probably not a good idea to put 0 in there, but whatever. Um, and we just you know, project them onto this x cubed curve. x3 is odd, so it has this nice kind of picture. And the claim is, if you take any two points here, uh, so here is an x coordinate 1 quarter and 3 quarters. Uh, of course, they would actually be integers, but that's OK. Uh, you can scale. Uh, then if you, so the sum of those is 1. And if you look at mi negative 1, that will, uh, the, you know, the cube of negative 1, which is 1, is exactly equal to uh, where these two cube points would hit if you extended the line. Yeah? And now we have the problem that if you want to use the version of three sum here which, where the three po points have to be different. Yep. So we definitely need that those guys are distinct. I'm, I'm sure that those two versions of three sum are equivalent up to subquadratic reductions, but I don't see how to prove it offhand. OK. Uh, cool. Now, why is this true? Uh, I I checked it. It's true. <laughs> you can do <laughs> half a page of uh, algebra and prove it. I don't have a great intuition for that. why this is true, but uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, it's easy enough to check where this line should go, and it happens to go exactly to the place where the sum <laughs> goes. So. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm guessing it would also work for x to the fifth, but I didn't check that. Um, okay. So, uh, so that was three points on a line. OK, so. Uh, Important life lesson about geometry is something called duality. So here we're interested whether there was one line that goes through three points. A complementary problem is I give you a bunch of lines. Do any uh, three of them pass through a common point? Is there one intersection between three or more lines? Okay, that is there a point that is on three lines? 
if you know projective geometry, this is totally obvious is the same problem as this. You just apply duality. Um, now, there are many different dualities. Uh, I'll give you two today. Um, first, my favorite is projective duality. Uh, and this is sort of the, mo the most standard, at least in math. If you have a point with x coordinate a and y coordinate b, you map that to the line ax plus by plus 1 equals 0, uh, and vice versa. So if I have a line, almost every line can be written this way. Every line that does not go through the origin can be written like this. And then you can convert it into a corresponding point. So if you give me a bunch of lines, just uh, translate so that none of them go through the origin. And then convert into a corresponding set of points. And the nice thing about this duality is it preserves incidence. Meaning, if before I apply duality, uh, I have a point and a line that are touching, then after I apply duality, I will have a line and a point that are touching. So uh, that's great because, in particular, a three-way intersection or you know a point that is on three lines will convert into a line that it goes through three points, and so we get a reduction from here to here. That's kind of like magic, but it works um, essentially because well, these um, if you think of a line over here as just a pair of coordinates, usually written a b then we're just taking essentially a dot product between those two things as a plus one. But it doesn't matter which one was the point and which one was the line. So that's very convenient. And you can use that to convert a lot of line problems into point problems. Um, one, I won't mention uh, k-sum very much. But obviously, the d-dimensional versions here are d plus one uh, sum hard. So that's the. Uh, these are sort of the more geometric versions of, of k-sum. OK, so uh, let's do some more problems. Next one's called separator. So let's say uh, we're given n line segments in the plane. Is there a line that separates them into any two non-empty groups? And that line is not allowed to intersect any of the segments. OK, so you're not allowed to split a line, uh, a segment into two parts. You just want to partition the line segments into uh, a left chunk and a right chunk. Uh, so there's actually two versions of this problem. Uh, the first version allows inf half infinite rays as segments. And then you can assume that all the segments are horizontal. So I think that pretty clearly <laughs> expresses it. Um, but we can, in particular, uh, think that we are reducing from geom base. Right? We had this set up. We have points on three lines. We want to know whether there's a line that passes through them. So I'm just going to take the complement, essentially, of those lines, omit tiny intervals uh, wherever I had points before. And now there will be a separating line if and only if uh, the original points had a line through them. Okay, if you make these tiny enough, you won't be able to do anything else. Whoops, yeah. I def right, yeah, the way you could just split them into third, two thirds. Yeah, I definitely need here that it's a non horizontal line. Thanks. Or is it non now, this requires having these half infinite rays. Otherwise, you could always uh, you could make a line like this. Right? So uh, you're not allowed to do that if these go off to infinity. Then you'd be cutting those rays. OK, so maybe you consider that reasonable. Maybe not. Depends on the application. Uh, if you don't consider half infinite things reasonable, uh, you can replace them with some vertical segments. You build this little box. 
uh, essentially a box uh, like a pinwheel pattern, so there's no way to cut it up except to go through the center. Um, so uh, two versions. Version one, we allow half infinite things and every segment is horizontal. Version two, horizontal and vertical segments, all finite length. We'll use this version uh, to reduce from a bunch of times, or we will follow this kind of reduction, essentially. Okay, next problem. Okay, next problem is called strips cover box. I like these names of problems, they're pretty clear. <laughs> um, <laughs> in fact, there's a so, so clear, here's a figure. <laughs> you have a box, which means axis aligned rectangle, um, and I have strips. Strips are, I take two parallel lines, and I take the lines in between them, right? All these parallel lines between here and here, that's a strip. So I'm given n strips, I'm given a box, I want to know whether there's an empty part or whether it covers. Are you also Question. given angles or just strips? Oh yeah, the, sorry, the angle, uh, the strips are placed. It's I give you two lines for each strip and I mean the region in between them. They're, they're, uh, they're on the plane, you can't slide them around. Oh. That would be a different, that would be a coverage problem. It's, it's pretty easy. I just want to compute whether there's any point in here that is not hit by any of the given strips. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I, I should mention all of these problems, uh, except where I say otherwise, can be solved in quadratic time. Uh, and so this is showing that that's essentially tight. So you can solve this problem by computing the arrangement of these lines in quadratic time and checking all the cells, whether they are in all the strips. So that's not hard. But the claim is you can't do any better than n squared if you believe the three-sum conjecture. Okay. Uh, and the reduction is essentially this, um, but I'm going to modify it a little bit. Uh, yeah. So remember this, uh, I rotated this 90 degrees for a reason because I want to use a particular kind of duality. Um, the construction is going to be the dual of this, uh, but remember, I want uh, here the goal is to find a line that does not hit any of these segments. Uh, so here's and the segments are vertical, or and they might be infinite, half infinite rays. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start from that, and then I'm going to dualize using a different dualization. This is probably the most popular one in computational geometry. I think because everyone remembers y equals mx plus b. And so there's the obvious conversion between a point, which has b and m, to a line, which is uh, mx plus b. Okay, you could argue about which is which, but I think this is the more common. So what this means is, uh, you know, I start with a point. The y coordinate determines the slope of my line, and the x coordinate determines the y intercept of my line. That's b. Um, and you can also convert in the other direction. I don't think we'll need to here. And that will work for all non-vertical lines. This will not represent vertical lines. In case you're curious, if you want vertical lines here or if you want uh, lines going through the origin here, you need points at infinity. That's the projective thing. But we don't need that here. Uh, because we're just going to take these points and convert each of them to corresponding lines. So this is a segment. I'm going to get an infinite number of points. Oh, sorry. Uh, there's an infinite number of points here. So I'm going to convert into an infinite number of lines. That's actually OK, because these points all have the same. Uh, sorry, opposite. I really want the x coordinate to be m, the y coordinate to be b, for this picture to be the right picture. Um, so all of these points have the same x coordinate. Uh, so they all have, when I convert them into lines, they will all have the same slope. And they'll also be right next to each other. <laughs> Namely, they will be a strip. Isn't that cool? So when you do this dualization, a vertical segment becomes a strip. I, th 
think the, the fancy word would be. Here you have a pencil of points, <laughs> and you convert that into a pencil of parallel lines. The pencil of parallel lines is a strip. Now, um, a pencil, a pencil just means like a continuous family. Uh, now here, uh, these guys are infinite, so it's going to be a strip that goes off to infinity on one end. That's a half plane. Okay, so if we have a ray, vertical ray, that's going to convert into half plane. So that's the half planes aren't allowed, so we're going to have to do something with them. But there's only six of them. There's three down here, three up here. Okay, and we also haven't defined what our target rectangle is, but at this point, what we would like to say, uh, so let's see, what would, what would it correspond to a line here? Notice the line will never be vertical. What, what would be a line that, that happens not to hit any of these things? In the dual, that line maps to a point, and so that's saying that there is a point that is not covered by any of these strips or half planes. Okay, so we want to know whether the union of these things is the entire plane. So that's not quite the problem we wanted to reduce to, uh, but it's not hard to fix it. We essentially just need to make a re take a really big rectangle, and then there'll be an empty point in there if and only if there was a, a line in this problem. Okay, how big does the rectangle have to be? Well, conveniently, these half planes uh, essentially narrow us down to a hexagon, because you have six of them. It might be less than a hexagon. Did I just draw six? Uh, and we're saying, you know, all of this stuff is covered. All the things outside the hexagon are covered by those half planes. So really, it's just a matter of whether this has any empty points. So take the bounding box of, the, of that hexagon. That's my box. So box. And now I don't have to worry about the, hexagon, uh, the, the half planes anymore. Um, I can restrict them. I should really use a color. Uh, I can just say, oh, well, now this is a strip, which covers, you know, in particular, I need to cover this part of the rectangle. I no longer need to go off to infinity. So now uh, I have a bunch of finite strips and a finite box, and it's just a matter of whether that thing has any empty parts. Yeah? So are the yes and those flipped up? Uh, yeah, there will be an empty point if and only if the original thing had a yes answer. Yeah, so they will cover if and only if you do not, if you have a no answer. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Just the nomenclature, do we have a name for the thing that you're using from the right? Because it's actually a special case of what you call separator, right? Yeah, uh, right. So what they say is this a reduction from geom base, okay. mimicking the proof of separator one. <laughs> yeah, there is, I don't have a name for it. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so what's the, uh, is the, is the uh, projective geometry function described there also preserving incidence? Yes, uh, this duality also preserves incidence. I think it's a slightly perturbed version of the regular projective duality. It is also a projective duality in a sense, but with an extra Mobius transformation thrown in or something. But those also preserve incidence. Yeah, we obviously need that. OK, uh, so to make this a little more usable, I mean, strips can be nice. We'll use it in some situations. But geometers tend to like to think about triangles. So we can also convert this into whether a bunch of triangles cover a given triangle. Uh, Basically, so here we are going to reduce from strips covering a box. We start with the box, and we're going to convert that. We'll draw on top of it so it's a little clearer. I'm going to take a really big triangle, which contains uh, that box, but then I'm going to add a, b and then I'll, we'll triangulate the exterior here. Um, and add those triangles to my covering collection. So all of this stuff is covered for free. And so now what remains, in order to cover this triangle, I just need to cover this box. OK, so uh, that's one part of it. Uh, and then the other thing is that we're given strips. Uh, so if I have a strip 
Actually, do I have a figure for this? No. Okay. If I have a strip in the original problem, which looks something like this, uh, I really only care about the portion of the strip that hits the box here. So uh, I will just so uh, triangulate that part and say those triangles are, are in my set. Okay, and then those triangles are going to cover this triangle. The red triangles will cover the red triangle, big red triangle, if and only if the white strips cover the white rectangle. Pretty easy. Uh, all we need is that these have constant complexity, so we're not blowing up by more than a constant factor. Uh, note here, all of the smaller triangles are contained inside the big triangle. So you can even assume that these guys are contained in this guy. We will use that at some point. Okay, possibly very soon. So, uh, next problem. Hole in union. I give you a bunch of triangles. I take their union. I want to know whether that's a simply connected polygon or whether it has a hole in the center. <laughs> uh, almost the same as this problem. I do have to do a little bit of work uh, because maybe you uh, actually pretty much that reduction will work fine. As long as the outer triangle is strictly bigger than the strip, then I'll always have these outer red things which make a region. And then there'll be a hole in there if and only if the rectangle's not fully covered. So I just need to enlarge that outer triangle slightly. Then I have a proof that this is three sum hard. Done. Uh, here we're also using that the red triangles are contained inside the big red triangle. They don't go outside and possibly make a hole in some other way. OK, another easy one. Triangle measure. I give you a bunch of triangles. What is the area of their union? Well, <laughs> it's going to be the area of the big triangle, if and only if the big triangle is covered. So this is a reduction from triangle covers triangle. OK, easy. Um, here's a somewhat different problem, point covering. Um, so here I'm given a bunch of half planes, 10 of them. Uh, and I want to know, is there a k-way intersection? Um, you can think of this as a version of two-dimensional linear programming. Uh, so this is all in 2D. You're given a bunch of linear inequalities, which are half planes. You want to know, not can I satisfy all of them? Maybe that's not possible, but can I satisfy at least k of them? So this is for approximating linear programming. There are a lot of algorithms for doing that. You can do this in quadratic time, but the claim is you can't do it better unless if you believe the uh, three-sum conjecture. OK, so this is, uh, I think I don't have a figure. No. We're going to reduce from strips cover box so we're given a bunch this figure again we're given a bunch of strips we're given a rectangle we want to convert that uh, whether the whole thing intersects to uh, whether there's a k-way intersection between infinite strips on one side half planes okay so here's what I'm going to do. If I have a strip, I should maybe really draw it this way, whatever. A bunch of parallel lines, finite uh, segment of them, but the lines are infinite in this, this direction and this direction. I'm going to convert that into the complement, a common trick here. So we have a half plane over here, and we have a half plane over here. 
Obviously, you cannot be in both of these at once because they're disjoint. So the best you can hope for is to be in one of them, which means you're not here. And remember, the whole question here is whether there's a point that is not in any of the strips. So you're going to get uh, one point. <laughs> you're going to get a score of one if you're here or here. You're going to get a score of zero locally if you're in the region that's, that's already covered. OK, uh, now we also need to represent the rectangle in some way. So uh, if I'm given a box, draw this line, this line, this line, and this line. And the half planes I want are the ones that contain the rectangle. So the idea is you're going to get four bonus points if you're in the rectangle. So, and now the question is, I'm going to set k to be n plus 4. I want to know, are there any points that are in n plus 4 of the half planes? To do that, you'd have to be in all four of these, in other words, in the box, and in, in one of these for every strip, because you can't be in both, uh, just to achieve that score of n plus 4. So that means you're exterior to all the strips, but inside the rectangle. So it's the same problem. All right. Next problem. It's a visibility problem. It's got a couple of visibility problems. Both of these problems are about something called uh, weak visibility. Uh, if you have two geometric objects, A and B, they are strongly visible to each other if every point over here can see every point over here. Meaning, uh, uh, C means you don't, the visibility line doesn't cross anything else. But what we're talking about here is weak visibility, which says there's some point over here which can see some point over here. So I want to know, say, given two segments, whether there's some point here, some point here, where if I draw the connecting visibility line, there's no other segment blocking it. So this is, this is A and this is B. This would be an example where A and B, well, they do weakly see each other because there's that pair. OK? So given n segments, you can construct what's called a visibility graph, which is all of these things in quadratic time. Uh, if I want to know whether this segment can uh, see another segment in this weak sense. That's three sum hard. Here's the proof. <laughs> uh, take exactly the same thing. Just add two segments. This segment can see that segment, if and only if there's a line. Okay. <laughs> this is uh, there's so many fun little things you can do, but these are problems that pe a lot of people have thought about, and they're always wondering, uh, can we do better than quadratic? Now we know. They're all sort of in the same bucket, more or less. OK. Uh, here's another problem. Yes, OK. So. Uh, the problem is I give you a bunch of triangles in 3D, and let's see, um, and maybe I give you a point up here, and I want to know whether that point can weakly see a given triangle. And here all the triangles are horizontal. Make it nice and simple, and it is possible to solve this, I think, in n squared log n time, or maybe n squared time. You can construct the visibility graph here in n squared, uh, because they're all horizontal. So um, I want to so given this point, I want to know, can it see any of t? Or is it completely blocked by these triangles? Sound familiar? If we point, put that point way up near or at infinity, depending on what you allow me, near infinity will be enough. This will essentially be orth orthographic projection of these triangles onto this triangle. It's a question of whether these triangles cover this triangle. So this is a reduction from triangles cover triangle to visible triangle. 
pretty easy. Just put all these guys really close, uh, slightly different z-coordinates so they're not overlapping, and put the point far away. So visible triangle is three sum hard. All right, uh, let's do some motion planning, robot motion planning. First in 2D. So planar motion planning. Um, I give you a segment, that's the robot. And I have, so this is the special one, it's the robot. Then I have various obstacles, which the uh, robot is not allowed to penetrate. I give you a starting position for the robot, and I give you a target position for the robot. I want to know, can I go from here to here by some motion, a motion you would allow rotations and translations? So can I slide this robot th somehow through this obstacle course? Maybe here, do some parallel parking, whatever. You can do lots of tricks to get from A to B. Uh, this problem can be solved in quadratic time. Most 2D motion planning problems with, with just rotation and translation can be solved in, in n squared time. Uh, yeah. And that's tight because of this. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we build these frames, which are large enough that it doesn't constrain the robot. Robot's big enough that it's going to have to simultaneously pierce all three lines here. And we're done. OK, great. All this build up for <laughs> very simple proofs. Uh, cool, one more. Is that one actually quadratic? Yeah, uh, you can solve this in quadratic time. Cubic is obvious. Uh, there are three degrees of freedom, but I think, in fact, quadratic time. That's, that's the claim in the paper. I haven't studied motion planning algorithms for a while, so I don't know exactly how it goes. But in general, uh, constant dimensional motion planning with constant numbers of objects can be solved in polynomial time. But yeah, you can uh, debate about the constants. OK. Which do matter here, but I think the claim is tightness for that one. Here's another one which can be solved in the claim. Here they say n squared log n. So uh, although it's, they say we can probably get n squared, but n squared log n is enough. Uh, it's a particular version of 3D motion planning. Uh, so we're given a vertical segment, that's our robot. We're going to have triangles. Those are our obstacles, because with triangles we can make polyhedra. In this case, all the triangles will lie horizontal in horizontal planes, and this, the segment position will be vertical. And here you're only allowed translation. With translation and rotation, you could also do this, but they restrict your translation only because there they can get a almost quadratic time algorithm. With rotation, you have to add a couple of factors of n, probably. But this version, they can solve in n squared log n. And it's three sum hard uh, by a similar kind of structure to the triangles covering triangle. Um, namely, we build this cage. The triangles aren't shaded in, but there's basically a triangle of triangles here and a bunch of them. The segment is, say, unit length, and so there's you know this many. Uh, to subdivide the space. This, they call this a cage. Uh, all of these triangles live in horizontal planes, but there's no way for this vertical robot with translation only to get out. It's too long. Uh, and so the starting configuration is going to be up here. The destination is going to be down here. And in the middle triangle here, we're going to put a whole bunch of triangles like this. So just squish this down, put them all in here, and then you're going to be able to penetrate if and only if there's a blank spot. Done. OK. End of this paper. Uh, I think we covered almost all of these proofs. We started with uh, the base problems, 3 sum, 3 sum prime, geom base, two versions of separator, uh, which we weren't directly reducing from, but we mimicked a zillion times. Uh, we had the degeneracy over here, strips covering a box, triangles covering a triangle, hole in a union, visible triangle. Those are actually all identical to each other. You can reduce in all directions. Uh, we talked about point cup. This was the linear programming, uh, motion, planar motion planning, 3D motion planning happened to reduce from here instead of there, uh, and visibility. Cool.
a lot of fun little reductions. And it gives you a flavor for n squared hard ish problems. Are the reverse directions of all those open? Or? I think all, all the reverse directions are open. Uh, I mean, you have to check all the papers since 1995, but uh, definitely in that paper they're open. And I haven't heard of any. Uh, there isn't a ton of work in going the other direction, but it would definitely be nice to. Uh, especially if, you know, if three sum, uh, it builds more evidence that three sum is the right problem if you can uh, do reductions in both directions. Okay. Um, I want to show you a couple more. I'll show you one more reduction, um, which relates to a problem that we proved was strongly NP complete at some point way back when. Um, this is about fixed angle chains. You have this kind of linkage structure. That you, these are rigid bars. These are rigid angles. But uh, you can still twist one segment around another. So it preserves the angles and the edge lengths. And so if I give you a structure like this, I want to know uh, if I spin along this edge, if I take all this stuff and rotate it out of plane around this edge, does it hit anything? Or can it go all the way around? What about this edge? What about this edge? What about this edge? This is a polynomial time fixed angle chain problem. I want to know for every edge which one's spinning causes a collision. Uh, in fact, if I just want to know whether these guys cause a collision, because if they do, uh, a plus b equals c. I think that's maybe clear enough. We threw b negative b over 2 in the middle. Uh, in this case, we've shifted the, the a, b, c is the x coordinate in this structure. And these are candidate foldings here where we miss, here where we collide. Um, we've s separated things out by taking every item of a, subtracting a huge number from it, to put it over here, and every item of c, adding a huge number. And because we're in the three sum prime problem, we know we get one item for each. So adding and subtracting a matching huge number will preserve all three sum pairs, or three sum triples. Um, so that lets us separate out this picture. And then you just have to check this reflection corresponds to adding in the right way because of the negation and the divided by two. But uh, that's it. So that's uh, another. And there, there are a bunch of other problems, like if I give you to polygons, I want to know whether I can translate this polygon to fit inside that polygon. That's also three sum hard. Proof is a little bit messy, so I don't have, have it here. Uh, let me mention um, another more recent use of three sum conjecture is some non quadratic lower bounds. So we're still going to assume the three sum conjecture, but we're going to prove that a problem requires some time other than n squared. So here are t two problems where this has been done. These are graph problems, which is cool because everything we've seen so far has been a geometric problem. weighted undirected graph, I want to know whether there's a three cycle, also called a triangle, of pr given weight. So I want to know, for example, is there a triangle of weight zero? This can be done in polynomial time, obviously. Uh, and what the lower bound says is uh, number of edges to the 1.5 instead of 2 or wha whatever you want to think about this. Um, minus epsilon. This, wha what the, this is Mihai Petrescu, what he says is this, this problem, finding this in this much time, is three sum hard. Meaning if this is possible, then three sum can be solved in subquadratic time. So there's a gap between this bound and three sum bound I introduced by the reduction. Uh, Here's another fun problem. Here we're given an unweighted graph, undirected graph. And we just want to find E triangles. Just list them for me, please. Uh, or tell me there aren't that many. Uh, that take, uh, you cannot do that in better than E to the 4 thirds minus epsilon time. Uh, if you believe the three-sum conjecture. So these are both three-sum hard in a different sense from what we were using before. 
before it was quadratic, quadratic. Now, with graphs, also there's v versus e, so, uh, but th neither of these are quadratic no matter how you slice them, so they're different. Um, so there are a small number of bounds of that form, and that's kind of an interesting and relatively hot area. So are people are thinking about that. Um, in particular, um, there's been a recent surge of interest in thinking about graph problems. Now, for graph problems, uh, all the, uh, there isn't a ton of work relating three-sum, which is a very arithmetic-based problem, to graph problems. But this is a, a beginning of that. Uh, but there's some other problems which people think are hard. Um, so let me give you some of them. Diameter. So here, we're given a weighted, undirected graph. I want to know. Uh, so delta VW, this is like CLRS notation. This is the uh, weight of the minimum weight path from V to W. And I want to know the max over all V and W. What is the longest, shortest path? That's diameter. Um, conjecture. Uh, no mm, V to the 3 minus epsilon algorithm. So here, uh, there's a lot of interest around cubic problems, because this problem seems cubic. Another closely related problem is all pairs shortest paths. Uh, I want to know delta of Vw for all V and W. This is, of course, a harder problem than diameter. Also, conjecture. This conjecture implies uh, conjecture over here. Uh, this one's a little more famous, the all-pair shortest path conjecture, is that you cannot solve this in truly subcubic time. There are, again, polylog improvements, um, but you cannot beat, uh, we don't know how to beat by a v to the epsilon factor, or n to the epsilon factor, over the standard algorithm, which would be, uh, what's it called, floyd warshall the triply nested loop, relax every edge n times. Uh, is the standard v cubed algorithm. Uh, for sparse graphs, you can do better. But for dense graphs, the claim is that's the best you can do. And so there's a bunch of problems that are all pairs shortest paths hard. There are some problems that are diameter hard. Um, being diameter hard is a little bit stronger. Uh, obviously, diameter can reduce to all pairs shortest paths via now we want a subcubic reduction, something n to the 3 minus epsilon time instead of n to the 2 minus epsilon. You can reduce diameter all pair shortest paths. Big open problem is whether you can reduce all pair shortest paths to diameter. Um, but you can reduce all pair shortest paths uh, to some cool problems. Uh, let me, I have an image of some reductions. Um, so a negative triangle. Uh, is there a triangle of negative weight? Okay, over here, we wanted a triangle of weight exactly 0. That helps you find things faster. Uh, over here, we just want a triangle of negative weight. There's more options for those. Finding that is all pairs shortest paths hard. You can reduce all pairs shortest paths to that problem. Kind of crazy. Uh, and here, the reduction is not a single or a constant number of call reductions, like we've been doing. D this has a huge output. This only has a yes or no output. <laughs> okay, So this reduction is a little bit crazy. But basically, you take the sum over all calls uh, for this reduction. Um, and you know it just has to work out that if you could solve a negative triangle in subcubic time, then you could also solve all pair shortest paths in subcubic time. Okay, So you take the sum of the uh, n primes uh, to the power 3 minus epsilon, this should work out to uh, n to the 3 minus epsilon. Okay, over the, the different sub call, the different calls you make to the negative triangle. So it's a weaker notion of reduction, which lets you prove these things. Kind of a big innovation from just a few, this one hasn't even been published yet. It will be in SOTA 2015. It's on the archive now. Um, and there have been a few papers over the last few years doing these kinds of reductions. Actually, the negative triangle one is from an older paper by uh, Veseliska Williams and uh, 
and Williams. Uh, it's a husband-wife team. Stanford. Uh, okay, some more problems. Radius. Uh, for vertex V, the radius around V is how big a ball do you need to grow in order to cover all the vertices. I want to know what's the most, the farthest vertex W from V. And then the radius of the graph is what is the best such vertex that minimizes the radius of the vertex. Uh, so closely related to this, but it is uh, equivalent to negative triangle. Both of these are, are this is a new, th well, okay, of course you can reduce negative triangle to, well, that's not so obvious. You can reduce radius to all pairs shortest paths because uh, <laughs> once you have all the deltas, you can compute that max min in quadratic time. Um, so that means all these problems are equivalent to each other up to subcubic reductions. Okay, uh, median is another problem very similar. I just replaced this max with a sum. So that's some other kind of central located vertex. Uh, that's median. And that's also equivalent to all these problems. So there's a growing list of problems that are uh, in this sort of cubic space. All the problems are conjectured to be cubic, and a lot of them are equivalent to each other, though there's this divide between diameter and all pairs shortest paths. There are some bounds assuming uh, versions of, e uh, assuming strong ETH. So if you have strong ETH, uh, then what? Uh, there's no e to the 2 minus epsilon algorithm. This is not quite what we want. We want v to the 3 minus epsilon. This is, this is a statement about sparse graphs. Um, you, you can beat this for dense graphs. For sparse graphs, this is interesting. Um, this is for the worst case relationship between v and e. Uh, so you get some things like this. You get this even if you allow some approximability. Uh, but we still don't have a way to actually prove this conjecture. Yeah. You haven't said anything about it. I assume that three sum and this world, there's no bridge between them. Uh, yeah, I believe there's no bridge currently. This is the closest thing, and they do seem similar. Uh, but you uh, and also here we have cubic, there we have quadratic. Uh, so maybe you can do it. Maybe with five sum you could show some relation. I don't know, but there's no no such theorem yet. Uh, this these problems sound very similar to these problems. In particular, listing a bunch of negative triangles is just as hard as finding one. And so there's some similarity to over here. But the constraint on the triangles is different. Here we want negative ones. Here, any triangle or triangle of zero weight. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's an interesting space and still very ongoing. A lot of all of these things, that this stuff, this stuff is all within the last four years. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how it develops. But it's sort of. These are the current approaches to understanding n squared and cubed and sort of the low end of the polynomial uh, spectrum. I think it's pretty interesting, uh, but also where we know the least and have the fewest general techniques for, for proving things. Three sum is a little more established, and there's uh, a bunch of proofs like the one you've seen. Not too many out there, actually, um, but uh, they're quite accessible. This stuff is still, uh, I think, converging, but very exciting things relating all these algorithmic problems to each other. And kind of a nice way for us to end. This is my last lecture for 6890. Um, and the next two classes are guest lectures by Kostas about algorithmic game theory in a class called PPAD and PPAD hardness, which is his own universe, uh, but around economic game theory and very cool stuff. He is the expert on it, so and he's a professor here. So he graciously agreed to do two lectures on it. It should be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks.